podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to the CCAN webinar. My name is Martha Bickett, and I'm a CCAN researcher based at Policy Studies Institute in London, um, and I'm going to be chairing today's webinar with Dr. Jill Westhorpe. Uh, for those of you who haven't joined us before, a uh, quick introduction to CCAN. CCAN stands for Centre for the Evaluation of Complexity Across the Nexus. We're a research centre funded by a group of UK research councils, government departments and agencies. Our aim is to test and promote innovative, re uh, innovative evaluation methods, um, methods that take into account and are appropriate for the complexity of the world around us. We're looking in particular at nexus issues, so those are the interlinked areas of food, energy, water and the environment. You can find out more about the work we're doing on our website, ccan.ac.uk, um, and there you can also sign up to our newsletter and follow us on Twitter at CCAN Nexus. So today's webinar is on complexity theory and invisible mechanisms and their implications for methods and commissioning. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Jill Westhorpe, who leads the Realist Research Evaluation and Learning Initiative, or REALLY for short, a Centre for Excellence in Realist Methodologies, uh, and that's at Charles Darwin University in Australia. So Jill's going to speak to us for around 45 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, please do submit your questions for Jill via the question box, uh, which you should be able to see on the GoToWebinar control panel, which popped up when you joined. Um, as chair, I'll then pose those questions to Jill in the Q&A. Uh, so please do get typing. Feel free to submit those questions at any point during the webinar today, all the way up to the very end. The session will be recorded. And uh, assuming everything goes to plan, it should be made available on the CCAN website afterwards. So uh, it's my great pleasure to pass you over now to um, Jill Westhorpe. Jill, over to you. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, hopefully, at about this point, you can see uh, my screen. Martha, are you able to confirm that for me? Yeah, that looks great, Jill. Thanks. OK, good. Um, good morning, everyone who's over on that side of the world, and good evening, everyone who's over on this side of the world. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you um, tonight. Um, for those of you who haven't met me before, um, I'm largely a specialist in realist research and evaluation, uh, but I've had a long history of interest in complexity and complexity theory. And one of my areas of interest is in how we bridge across the ideas of um, complexity theory and uh, realism. And that's the origins and, and the background for uh, this presentation. Um, there are really two big ideas that I want to grapple with in this um, presentation. One of them is the idea of simple rules, which comes from complexity theory. It's part of the theory of emergence um, and whether or not we can consider simple rules to be mechanisms. The second big, big idea is about why mechanisms are described in realist approaches as being invisible. Why are mechanisms invisible? And why is it that that matters for evaluation and for commissioning of evaluation? In order to get there, I'm going to skim far too fast over um, a lot of ground. So why causation matters in evaluation? and underlying that, why our constructs of causation matter. Um, a little quick snippet about the common foundations of complexity theory and realism. Um, I'll put up a couple of slides that deal with principles of complexity theory, but I won't speak to most of them because I want to focus tonight, uh, this morning, on the idea of emergence. Um, and then I want to compare that idea of emergence with the realist understanding of causation. And by bridging across the two, think about what it is that we need to do or how we need to think if we are going to treat simple rules as mechanisms. Then I'm going to skip across to this idea about why mechanisms are invisible and why that matters for our methods. Um, and if we've got time, I'll do a 
a quick thought experiment that looks at the idea of um, simple rules uh, in consensus building in coalitions. It's my gut hunch that a lot of um, programs operating across the nexus also operate through coalitions and this might therefore be relevant to quite a lot of people. Um, and then of course a quick summary at the end to tie it all together. So the first little bit is just setting the ground and I'm going to skim through it really quickly because I'm assuming that we all agree that causation matters in evaluation for a number of different reasons. Firstly, uh, in relation to program purpose, all programs are in fact causal. They're, they are trying to cause something to be different, to cause change or steer change. Uh, it's important because if we understand how our programs work, i.e. by what causal processes they work, and in what circumstances those causal processes work or don't work, then we can use that information to um, improve effectiveness and to enable us to adapt programs to context. If we understand what's most likely to work, how and why it works, then we can also um, work towards greater cost effectiveness. And of course, there's the issue of accountability. If we want to be able to attribute change or a proportion of a change that we're seeing to a program, then understanding how the program got there, how it caused its outcomes is one of the arguments that we can use to claim attribution. Um, so if those are the reasons why causation matters in evaluation, why does the nature of our theories of causation matter? Well, the first argument I think is that general theories of causation underpin the specific theories of causation in our programs. Um, our theories and beliefs drive our decisions and actions, and therefore if our theories are wrong, our decisions and actions might be as well. And of course, just as with any element of the program itself, our theories guide what we measure. And I'm going to come back to that uh, in terms of the implications for evaluation a bit later on. So uh, this little bit is about the common underpinnings of complexity theory and um, realism. Complexity theory, of course, is one form of um, systems theory and both complexity theory and realism um, share some aspects of systems theory. Of critical importance to the arguments that I'm going to be making today um, is that every system is comprised of a number of subsystems. We've got the individual human there on the left of the screen being comprised of a whole bunch of subsystems. And each of those subsystems is in turn made up of smaller um, systems um, and so on. Meanwhile, however, of course, everything is also, every subsystem or every system is also part of a larger system. Our individual human might be part of a family uh, with children who attend a school, which is part of an education system, which is part of a wider socio-political economic system, et cetera, et cetera. It's um, an absolute fundamental of all forms of systems theory and of complexity theory that different levels of systems have different powers and capacities and those powers and capacities are not reducible to those of their parts. And that's going to turn out to be um, of critical importance when we're thinking about causation. Systems are of course open and not closed or these kinds of systems are. Um, causation operates both up and down levels of systems and it's complex, it's not singular. There's always multiple causes of any outcome and any outcome can then uh, cause multiple um, consequences itself. So that's all 101 revision. Um, complexity theory, um, I'm thinking particularly in terms of complex adaptive systems. Um, those are systems which can evolve and self-modify. Uh, they can adapt to their environment and they can take in information and use it both to change themselves and uh, for cognizant systems to deliberately change their uh, environments for non-cognizant systems by the act of changing themselves to cause change in other parts of the systems. Um, so 
of course, as we've already said, individuals, families, organisations, um, and the things that we normally think of as being systems are all complex adaptive systems. So too are programs. Programs are open complex systems. And wicked problems are, of course, manifestations of complex systems in um, the manifestations of complex systems operating in complex systems. Now, there are many um, elements in the description of complex systems which can be translated directly across to the operation of program systems or any other systems that we might research or evaluate using realist methods. There isn't time to deal with each of these um, in this presentation, which is a bit of a shame because all of them have implications for how causation works. Interdependence, multidimensionality, co-evolution and self-similarity all in slightly different ways imply that if you change one part of a system, other parts of the system will also be uh, affected and will also change. Um, I'm simply leaving those on the slides, put those bits on the slides so that people can refer back to them later if they so wish. Um, similarly, non-linearity is really important in terms of programs and program evaluation. Um, it rather calls into question the idea of um, program dose. Historicity shapes the context and the options that are available for change. And of course, systems will reorganise of their own volition if the context becomes too inhospitable, if the system itself is pushed, as they say, far from equilibrium, then it will simply reorganise itself. But the principle that I'm focusing on in this presentation and that I'm most interested in is that of emergence, the idea that interactions between local actors or local elements of a system following quote unquote simple rules, that's the key idea here, generate new forms of, of organisation or complex patterns of outcomes at higher levels of the system. Came across a nice quote for that today uh, in an article that um, I'll draw on if we get time to do the thought experiment. Emergence is the idea that simple elements that are governed by a few simple rules and here are the new bits, operate through trial and error with interaction and feedback, all really critical bits of the definition, can produce persistent and systematic patterns that are quite unlike the original elements. Now, of course, there are different types of simple rules when you're talking about different types of systems or different levels of systems. For conscious actors like humans, um, the simple rules can be decision-making rules. And, um, the actors can, of course, also change the rules and thereby change the outcomes. For the few people who might be online who aren't already familiar with it, um, the um, simple example of simple rules comes from a computer simulation called the Boids, where um, Boids are computer simulated birds. Um, and the simulation is of the flocking behaviour of birds. And um, what the programmers did was program in three simple rules. First of all, steer to avoid crowding uh, your local flock mates, uh, steer towards where the rest of the crowd are going, and steer to move towards the average position um, of uh, the flock. And they discovered that by, with those three simple rules, their simulation could simulate the behavior of a flock of birds. Other people uh, then moved in and said, well, hang on, there are also other rules. And they added other rules that um, turned out to explain other behavior patterns, um, fear and um, avoiding obstacles and changing who's at the front of the pack. Um, rules for those kinds of things could be built into the simulation. Now, this is, of course, an example of emergent behaviour. The complexity of the behaviour of the boys arises from the in interaction of the individual agents um, following a simple set, a set of simple rules, a simple set of simple rules. Um, and I'm going to come back to this idea later because the argument that I'm making is that simple rules can be treat, treated as mechanisms or can be one way of thinking about mechanisms. 
But in order to do that, I first need to um, think about the what what do we mean by the term mechanisms? The questions that I'm I'll be looking at are are simple rules mechanisms, or if not, can we use the idea of simple rules as a way to think about mechanisms in realist evaluation? So in order to get there, um, quick re recap on realism's understanding of causation. The philosophical understanding of how causation works in realism draws in large part on the work of uh, Roy Bascar. Um, this is an oversimplification of his idea of um, depth ontology or a different way of thinking about layers in reality. At the top level we have that um, which is described as being the empirical level. It's things which can be observed or experienced. At the next level down we have the actual, what Bascar described as the actual level, that's events, things which happen whether or not there's anybody there to observe them. So to answer the philosophical question, uh, when the tree fell over in the forest, there really was a tree, that it really wasn't a forest, it really did fall over and that really did cause the difference in air pressure that would be interpreted as sound by a working human ear had there been a working human ear there to hear it. And then underneath that level, there is the level that um, is often described as the real, although actually the real subsumes the actual and the empirical as well. But that is the level at which mechanisms operate. And mechanisms simply described is that which causes that which happens. Um, and it is for a realist just as real as the events or the existences that operate at the level which can be observed um, and that which is observed. We don't, for example, actually see capillary action drawing water to the top of a tree, but it's happening even though we can't see it and it's real and it's part of the causal process for the tree growing and surviving. What Pawson and Tilly did um, when applying this to evaluation was to think about this idea of invisible mechanisms and ask what is it that's going on that we can't see that causes the program outcomes. And they came up with this notion of program mechanisms being an interaction between the resources, opportunities or constraints that are provided by programs um, influencing the something inside the heads of decision makers along the way. So that might mean staff or it might mean eventual participants or whatever. But in some way, what's being provided by the program is influencing things that go on inside human heads, which changes the decisions or the choices that they make, which leads to new behaviours. Um, and that's what generates the different outcomes. Um, they also said that like all mechanisms, um, program mechanisms only operate if the context is right. And so they thought about what are the sorts of contexts that affect program me mechanisms. Well, there's all sorts of things about contexts in which and processes through which programs are implemented. There's all sorts of things about the individual, their individuals, their culture, gender, resources, history, previous experiences and whatnot. There's all sorts of stuff about the circumstances, the politics, the economics, the stability, the violence, whether or not there's a drought or a flood, et cetera, et cetera. And the opportunities and resources that, um, that are required to enable different decisions to be implemented. And it's that interaction between contexts and mechanisms that generates the patterns of program outcomes. And the word patterns is in um, capitals, bold capitals there, because realists are not particularly interested in the average outcome. We can tell you that, and it does have a purpose, but we are much more interested in understanding how and why we see different so sorts of outcomes in different contexts. So how do we bridge across from the realist understanding of causation and the 
complexity theory um, understanding of causation as simple rules. Both realism and complexity understand causation as involving processes at one level of a system that generate outcomes at another level of the system. Both approaches recognise context as being absolutely critical. Realism says, as we've just seen, that underlying invisible causal mechanisms generate the outcomes. Simple rules structure the behaviours which generate outcomes at higher levels of a system and changing the rules changes the outcomes at the higher level of the system and therefore I argue that simple rules can be understood as mechanisms generating outcomes at a higher level of the system. So if we take that argument and think about it a little bit, under what conditions can simple rules be conceptualised as being mechanisms? Well, firstly, we can say that the simple rules might be operating at the material, um, as in physics, physical, uh, biological, psychological, social or institutional levels. They will, however, operate at a different level of the system than the outcome that they either structure or, or cause. Um, and that the sim what the simple rules actually do is structure interactions or processes which cause or contribute to either the nature of or the extent of outcomes. And those su simple rules are applied according to context, but they do have some continuity across sets of circumstances. So even in the Boyd's example, um, we've got one rule, simple rule saying, don't crowd your flock mates, and another rule saying, head in the same direction and stay close into the centre. And you have to apply both those simple rules um, at the same time to um, generate the successful flocking behaviour of birds, where they do all head in the same direction, but they don't knock each other out of the sky. So that's my basic argument in terms of simple rules can be seen to be mechanisms. Now I want to turn attention a little bit and think about this other question of why is it that mechanisms, according to realists, are invisible and why does that matter for evaluation and commissioning of evaluations and i'm arguing that there are really three basic reasons why mechanisms are invisible the first one is that they are operating at a different level of the system than the outcome that they generate the second is that they operate at different time scales than the outcome that they generate and the third reason is that they necessarily depend on relationships and interactions between components that may or may not be observable, um, at least with currently available instruments and processes. And what I'm going to do is take each of those reasons why mechanisms are invisible in turn, explain them a little bit more, and then to talk about their um, implications for evaluation and commissioning. So the first idea was that mechanisms are invisible because they're operating at a different level of the system than the outcomes that they generate. And Basquiat gives the example of the neurophysiological organisation of human beings may be said to provide a basis for their power of speech. Uh, we also see in other realist um, writings that um, causation is understood to work downwards as well as upwards. Um, because every level of a system causes and or constrains other levels of the system. And absolutely critically for this, uh, for what follows, every level of a system has its own powers and liabilities, which may cause effects at other levels of the system. And remembering our basics of systems theory and complexity theory, those powers and liabilities are not reducible to the component parts, even though they de may depend on the component parts and the organisation of those component parts. So what does that mean for evaluation? Well, it means to understand causation, we must necessarily investigate levels of systems other than that should say other than 
that at which the outcomes of interest are occurring. Um, now, depending on how we've conceptualised the system, the causes might in fact actually lie in a different system entirely. And we have to think about that when we're deciding where we're drawing the boundary of the system that we are considering to be in scope for the evaluation. It also means, however, that investigating different levels of systems might require very different methods or tools. If you're thinking about um, the physical operation of mechanisms in the um, environment in terms of food or climate, those require very different kinds of um, investigation than the investigation of um, human decision making, for example. And by uh, logical implication, reasoning and resources, the Pawson and Tilly construct of program mechanisms, won't be appropriate for some levels or some kinds of systems. And so we're going to need different constructs of mechanism if we're going to be able to investigate causation at multiple levels of system. So what might some of those other ways of conceptualising mechanisms be? I've said for some time that there are at least five ways to think about mechanisms. Um, now I'm adding the idea of simple rules as mechanisms, um, so saying six ways to think about mechanisms. And one of my criteria for thinking about mechanisms is that um, for it to be a causal mechanism, you should be able to see how it could operate at multiple levels of a system. So we can take uh, Pawson and Tilly's idea of reasoning and resources, and we can say, yep, we could look lower down into the system and see, for instance, within humans, um, at a physical, um, material or chemical level, we could investigate the way that neurons fire or don't and the chemicals that are involved in that process. We can look into inside the human's thinking, the psychological and or affective level uh, and think about the logic in use. Uh, we can think about how groupthink influences decision making in committees, for example. And or we can think about how norms operate at the societal or institutional level. So I use those four levels of um, physical, intra-individual, group or social and societal or institutional to think about, can I think about how these mechanisms operate at different levels, these, these constructs operate at different levels. So then I read a whole lot of ways that different authors have described um, mechanisms or tried to explain mechanisms and discovered that there were at least four different explanations other than forces and Porson and Tilly's. Um, there was a description of forces. Now, forces are things that are either push or pull. Um, and so at the material level, we've got gravity. At the intra-psychological level, love pushes or pulls us to do lots of different things. The social level, so too does peer pressure. At the social level, we can think about laws which operate to prompt or constrain um, behaviours. Another way that people described mechanisms was as interactions, a transfer of some kind between um, two elements that in some way results in a changed state. So the classic material example is gunpowder and the explosion. But you can also think about um, contracts. Uh, I buy a house, today I've got um, new powers and responsibilities, powers and liabilities that I didn't have yesterday after I bought the house as a result of this um, contract, uh, this interaction. Or you can think about the way that new technologies are creating new market systems, for example, that involves a whole set of interactions at different levels of systems. The most typical um, kind of pure realist understanding of mechanisms is the idea of powers and liabilities. The inherent abilities and weaknesses of things, whether or not they are currently in use. So trees have the power to grow, regardless of whether or not they actually do in a particular context. Humans have the power to learn. Groups have the power to make agreements. States have the power to make laws. Whether workers have the power to work, whether or not they're currently employed, and so on. And the other way um, was to think in terms of processes, um, feedback and or feed forward sequences in which the later elements 
depend absolutely on the earlier um, processes in the sequence. So genetic inheritance or the process of a stock market crash are examples there. And now I'm adding this sixth way of thinking about mechanisms, which is to say simple rules which are physical or biological or social rules which structure reasoning in relation to reasoning and resources or which structure interactions or which structure processes and thereby shape the nature of the outcomes um, that are generated. So, okay, if we accept for the purposes of the argument that there are different ways of thinking about mechanisms, what does that mean for evaluation? Well, first of all, it implies that you need to choose a construct of mechanism that is appropriate for the particular causal process that you're investigating at that moment. And it, if it's a human decision-making process, then reasoning and resources may well be appropriate. But if it's not, then you'll need some other construct. Uh, there might be different mechanisms within the same program or the same investigation um, that are best approached using different constructs. And because our theories guide our observations, the construct of mechanism that you use should alter the nature of the data that you collect in order to assess or measure whether or not that mechanism is actually operating. So if you're using Porson and Tilly's construct of reasoning and resources, then you need to collect data about what the resource is and what the reasoning is uh, in response to that resource. But if you're using the construct of interaction, then you need to be thinking about what the elements that are doing the interacting are and what the nature of that interaction is and how it is that that interaction causes change. So you'd actually be collecting different data for uh, that different construct. Second reason why I said that um, mechanisms are invisible is that they operate at different time scales than the outcome of interest. Now there are some mechanisms that operate exactly at the moment or pretty well at the moment that the outcome is generated. Um, the chemical interaction of gunpowder and the bang when it explodes um, are pretty close to instantaneous. But if you think about early intervention programs in child development, the short term outcomes take years to manifest. And in fact, outcomes can go on being generated across the lifespan. If you're thinking about the time scales for evolution, the mechanisms can take multiple generations. The other thing is that because outcomes um, require either multiple sequences of processes or repeated action to be, effect to be effective, actually the mechanisms themselves can evolve over time. So you might have one kind of mechanism, like a conscious choice made by a participant in response to some resource provided by the program, which might become another kind of mechanism, like habit as a result of another kind of mechanism, a new pathway being built into the brain structure as a result of the habit through the process of myelination um, within the human brain. So we've got outcomes happening at multiple levels of, of the system because there are mechanisms firing at multiple different levels of the system and the nature of the mechanisms and the nature of the, of the outcomes uh, can happen at different time scales. What does that mean for evaluation? Well, first of all, it means that our program theory should take account of the changing nature of change, both the changing nature of mechanisms and the changing nature of outcomes over time. That implies that ideally we want adequate time frames uh, for our evaluation and in important areas we want some longitudinal studies to be happening as well so that we can look back and see over what kinds of time frames do we see what sorts of outcomes. It means that we won't just be using repeated measures of the same indicators as some kinds of outcome evaluation currently primarily do or that we'd be looking at the same kinds of outcomes and therefore able to use the same kinds of observations. We will need 
um, different indicators for different kinds of outcomes at different points in time. And the same will apply to mechanisms because the nature of the mechanisms will change at different points in time. So the measures that we use for those or the observations or the ways that we try to understand and investigate those mechanisms will also need to change over time. And of course, no evaluation is ever going to be able to investigate all of this. And so one of the implications is that in order to fill out the picture, to fill in the bits that we can't possibly investigate, we may need to draw on, and therefore we need commissioners to commission for, research to fill in the most critical of the gaps. Third reason was um, that uh, that mechanisms are invisible is that they depend on relationships and interactions between the components, some of which might not be observable. Uh, why not? Again, those interactions might be at much lower levels of the system. Um, they hardly ever let you chop up the humans to investigate the thought processes going on in their heads. Um, interactions at very high levels of systems, uh, for example, between political and economic systems, you can't actually see them happening. You can investigate them, but you can't see them. Um, and the interactions are always themselves happening at multiple levels of systems. So even when some of the interaction might be observable, for example, you can see that two humans are communicating, um, there are other levels of that interaction that you can't see for example, the unconscious drivers of particular responses um, within that communication, which of course are likely to be difficult for the two, uh, different, I mean, sorry, for the two humans involved. And the implications of that for evaluation, well, the obvious ones are identify the relevant interactions and make those interactions a focus of the investigation. And some of that might be observational, but some of it might require, as we've mentioned before, different um, tools and methods for investigation at different levels of systems. But I would add to that that we can look to identify the simple rules that shape and construct those operations, those interactions and the circumstances in which they operate and don't. And that's taking a realist approach to the idea of the simple rules um, operating as mechanisms in particular contexts and not in others. So in about three minutes flat, I'm just going to do whiz through a quick thought experiment. I picked up an article today um, called Consensus Building and Complex Adaptive Systems. It's quite old, um, but very interesting. And by consensus building, we, the authors are referring to an array of practices in which stakeholders selected to represent different interests come together face-to-face, -face, long term dialogue to address a policy issue of common concern. Very common strategy in complex um, problems. Now I chose this article because um, the topic matter of um, consensus building and co how coalitions work is relevant a lot across a lot of sectors, including for evaluation across the nexus. Secondly, because it explicitly draws on complexity theory, although I was rather disappointed to discover that it doesn't it's not specific about simple rules that it's uh, that it implies might be there. Yeah. And thirdly, because it draws on formal theory, um, and it uses the theory of communicative rationality by Habermas. Um, and realists use formal theory primarily to identify mechanisms and the context in which they operate. And I thought, oh, that might be interesting to see whether we can blend the two. <coughs> And the next couple of pages are just extracts. The next couple of slides are just extracts that you can read later, but I have included them here in uh, the interests of um, being transparent so that you can see what I based the next um, couple of slides on. So first of all, we've got a quick summary of some of um, Habermas's theory of emancipatory knowledge. That's um, knowledge which can transcend the blinders created by our conditions and institutions. This is a further quote from the article, of course. This type of knowledge is critical in a world of rapid change where our understandings and institutionalized ways of describing, thinking about and measuring our world may not keep up with its changes. 
Communicative rationality represents an ideal, rather like that of scientific rationality, which is never fully achieved in practice, although it is a goal or template against which to research or judge. So we've got these ideas in here about the participants being equally informed, being listened to, being respected, power being shared, challenging of assumptions, and so on and so on. Now we've got a series of statements about the longevity of um, the process and the way that the longevity contributes to the development of trust and sincerity. We've got a statement that re re relates to representativeness of the stakeholders. We've got a statement that relates to agreements built in these kinds of processes uh, being of good quality because they take into account the unique knowledge offered by each stakeholder. And uh, we've got a statement about um, discussions being focused on interests rather than arguments about predetermined positions. And the authors identify a whole series of what they call first, second and third order effects, but which for um, most realist evaluations would be seen as being um, either mechanisms and outcomes or intermediate outcomes leading to higher level outcomes. I'm not going to go through all, through all of them, but it's quite interesting claims. And then what I did was I thought, OK, so how would a realist approach this? And I thought for some of those uh, elements, we as, real, as realists would describe those as context. So in the context where you've got all significant interests represented, this idea of simple rules, simple rule, be respectful and be equitable in your communication. Simple rule, take into account the unique knowledge of all perspectives. Um, contribute to the generation of the outcome of intellectual property as identified in the right hand column. But then I thought, how do those simple rules actually work? Is there an underlying mechanism for the simple rules? And if you think about how people change their positions, you ended up in the changes of perspective, for example, that might be uh, explained by the mechanisms of assimilation and accommodation in learning. Um, however, this idea that if we're all just nice to each other, then we'll all end up agreeing and um, end up with changed positions can backfire if people are focusing on their positions pre-existing positions, not how the interests might be met. And there, the mechanism, the simple rule might be assert and defend your position. And the underlying mechanism that fires might be cognitive bias, rejecting information that contradicts your existing beliefs with an outcome of entrenched um, conflict. And the only other one I did, you could do this for hours and hours, but I just did three. Uh, this idea that with a long-term structure and consistent uh, membership, um, a simple rule of respectful interaction builds trust. How does that happen? Trust turns up all the time in realist evaluations. What is actually going on there? Well, one of the little bits of research that I found today was um, a set of research that claims that social behaviours, smiling, shaking hands, uh, nodding at people when they're talking to you, trigger the release of oxytocin, which is a hormone which um, enables and triggers empathy. And empathy drives moral behaviour, which increases trust, which increases the release of oxytocin. And so you get a positive spiral of uh, relationship building that ends up in an intermediate outcome of social capital. Um, positive relationships built and um, and trust between participants. I also found the research that said that's not how it works really. So don't take it as true, just take it as a hypothesis that could be investigated further. So final quick slide, further implications for commissioning um, evaluations. I am taking it as read that interventions across the nexus are necessarily complex and it is not reasonable to assume that quick or simplistic evaluations are going to be adequate to provide um, 
complex um, or comprehensive answers. So commissioners need to be clear that they understand the, the program theory for what it is that they're evaluating. And ideally, the program theory should be complexity consistent. And if it's a realist evaluation, it should also be realist consistent. Um, and that theory should be used to shape the research or evaluation questions that are in the request for tender or the request for proposal. Adopting any theory-based approach should, of course, influence every aspect of evaluation design. The questions, the methods, the instruments, everything about it, the way they go about analysis, everything. And so checking both the way the tender is written and the tenderer's understandings and approaches is really important. What model of causation underlies the evaluation design? Are they saying we believe in complex causation, but we're going to do an RCT and we're only going to look at outcomes? I would argue that that's inconsistent. Wrapping up, complexity theory and realism both recognise uh, the idea of complex open systems in which causation itself is complex, multiple and context dependent. Both complexity theory and realism use the idea of emergence to explain how the powers of higher levels of systems are created by but not reducible to the powers of their constituent parts. Uh, the words that um, realism and complexity theory used to describe approaching causation are different mechanisms and simple rules but I would argue that it is possible to consider simple rules to be mechanisms because they structure and generate outcomes and similarly consistent with all other kinds of re realist investigation the levels below the simple rules can also be investigated as I did with the, that thought experiment. There are, of course, multiple different ways, or I, I would argue it's, of, of course, not everybody agrees with that, different ways that we can approach the idea of mechanisms. The constructs that we choose should be appropriate to the nature and level of the system that we're investigating at that moment. And the ones that we choose have implications for the methods that we should use to investigate them. And regardless of the construct, mechanisms are generally invisible because they're operating at different levels of a system over different time scales and involving interactions that might not be observable. And each of those has specific implications for how causation should be investigated and therefore how evaluation should be commissioned. That's the end for now. I'm happy to uh, take questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, hi, everyone. This is Martha again. We now have some time for questions and answers. So if you have any questions for Jill, please do type them in and send them over to me via the question section, uh, which is in the GoToWebinar panel on your screen. I'll start off with a couple of questions that I received um, as you were talking, Jill. Um, so the first one is around these simple rules. Um, why must the rules be simple and what makes a rule simple? <laughs> uh, they're very good questions and uh, not ones that I've given a lot of thought to. Um, I think why the rules probably need to be simple, but I'm making this up off the top of my head, is that um, they are guiding decisions that are made um, kind of instantaneously. If you think back to the Boyd's example, it doesn't actually take complex rules to generate the complex pattern of outcomes. Um, you only need fairly simple rules. Now, I think a lot of the complexity that happens in social programs um, or in the social aspects of, for example, environmental programs, is that um, there are multiple levels of the system being guided by multiple rules um, and it's actually the interaction of many, many, many simple rules that makes it seem complex. What makes a rule simple? Good question. I think if you can say it in one sentence in simple words, that might be enough. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's got multiple phases to it or multiple levels, then it's probably complex. I don't know, that's just me thinking out loud. We'll go with that for now. Thank you very much. Um, 
The next one is, please could you explain more how simple rules are different from forces? I think that's from in your description of types of mechanism. Yeah, um, forces, the description that's used in the um, texts where I found that, it was usually people talking about things like gravity. Um, it's a force, but we can't see it. Now that it's been theorised and hypothesised, we're getting better at being able to measure it but we still can't see it. So it was talking about these kind of invisible forces that push or pull things to happen. Um, simple rules, it's possible that some forces could be described as simple rules, um, but um, the simple rules that drive the voids, for example, steer together with your flock mates, but don't bump into them, for example, are not things that you would describe as forces. They are just guides to behaviour that can be overridden when the context is right. If you get a big enough fright um, or there's a big enough obstacle that you need to avoid, then you change the rules. Whereas gravity as a force is not changed uh, by your immediate circumstances, she said carefully. <laughs> 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 go sufficiently into the outer space it might be slightly different anyway <laughs> all right yeah. um here's a third one for you how are concepts of culture and tradition expressed as mechanisms in contexts of local emergence and complexity yeah uh usually well they can be described either as context or as mechanisms so that's the first point but when describing them as mechanisms, it's usually about identifying what the underlying cultural norm is and then how that, uh, that relates to a particular behaviour or a particular outcome. Um, and so um, there may, of course, be multiple norms operating concurrently to generate a particular outcome. Uh, but it's, it's normally that way of thinking, I think, <laughs> uh, of culture as being made manifest in norms, which you might think of as being rules for guiding behaviour. Um, and they then play out differently according to both local uh, variations in the culture, but also according to the circumstances in which people find them at the time. So there are slightly different rules for how you behave in different circumstances in almost all cultures and they vary according to your social status, your age, your gender, your, you know, a whole range of different circumstances. And you take those things into effect, usually as contexts that are affecting the operation of the norm. Mm. Um, I've got some questions here about uh, working with these issues. Um, one is, um, do you have any examples where evaluators have been able to work collaboratively with commissioners working with mechanisms and emergence? Um, working with mechanisms and emergence, I'd have to say working with mechanisms, absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot of realist evaluations that are undertaken um, collaboratively because you need to draw on things like program theory and that's often uh, initially located in or with um, the commissioners of the evaluation. Um, but I've regularly done um, participatory evaluations, for example, participatory realist evaluations with commissioners of evaluations being there in the design, in the identification of the draft hypotheses, in the collection of the data, the analysis of the data, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of emergence, um, the um, the mechanisms have usually been the way of getting at the idea of there is something underneath this causing the outcomes, but I don't see any reason why the fact that you're thinking about emergence should make any difference in principle to whether or not you can do it collaboratively between commissioners and evaluators. Mm. Um, next one is, what is your take on the risk of policymakers confusing simple rules with simplification, um, mostly using a reductionist <laughs> approach? Yeah, um, a very good point and something that should be laboured, be belaboured during the process. Mm -hmm. um, I, my experience is most commissioners of evaluations are actually smart, um, well-intentioned, thoughtful, and aware of 
a whole range of constraints that are affecting not just them and the operations of their program, but the evaluation as well. And if we <laughs> engage in um, maybe Habermas's idea of, you know, the constructive um, conversations with them, then um, the process of mutual learning, I think, can move people from simplistic to understanding that a simple rule is applied contingently. All simple rules are applied contingently, depending on context, um, and um, help build understanding that way. Uh, there'll be exceptions to that rule, but that would be my general take. Mm. Have you um, have you had any thoughts about how to, to test out or evaluate your way of looking at mechanisms to see how useful this is? Um, I've had thoughts about it. I haven't had the opportunity to engage in it in quite the way that I've described it here uh, tonight yet. I certainly do use more than one construct construct of mechanism in my own um, evaluation work. Uh, the idea of using simple rules as mechanisms I haven't tested yet but I hope to. Mm. Um, we've got just three more minutes left. I'm going to try and get through um, some more of these questions. They're rolling in which is great. Um, one is uh, when change in systems can be rapid how can you build in sufficient time to evaluate and properly understand rules and mechanisms, uh, especially when informed change is being sought to change you know, policy approaches? Mm, mm. Um, yes, it's a, it's a really critical issue because change can be extremely rapid. Um, setting up good monitoring systems so that you become aware that the change is happening is, um, of course, step one. Um, step two is about the nature of the um, commissioning and contracting processes so that commissioners are aware that um, there needs to be time available for that or we're going to miss some of the process, uh, some of what, what's really important. And the third is probably to build in some of the approaches that are used in things like developmental evaluation where you don't necessarily write a full report at the end, you have much more engaged, much more rapid return, rapid uh, analysis of changing contexts and changing processes as well as you work through the process. Developmental evaluation was developed for interventions that are never going to settle down and take a final shape, but I think they it can be applied as well um, in relation to circumstances of rapid change where the, the context is changing rapidly. And there's no reason why you can't use um, realist approaches and, and complexity ideas. Complexity is already written into developmental evaluation. There's no reason why you can't do realist developmental evaluation as well. Mm. Um, and so I think one final question following on from that, uh, to, to what extent does complexity require us to do evaluation in a new way or do we just need to do the very best practice in evaluation where complexity is concerned? <laughs> Well, I don't think I can answer that because it depends what your construct of very best practice is. Um, if you are trained in and believe in the model of RCTs, for example, as being the one true path to uh, understanding um, effect sizes of outcomes, then your model of best practice is going to be very different than your model of best practice if you're at heart a constructivist and most interested in trying to understand how participants in programs understand their experience in the program and why they make the decisions that they do. That's got a very different um, construct of best practice. So I think the models that you take and the philosophical underpinnings that each of them have absolutely should construct um, how you go about um, the nature of evaluation and what constitutes good practice. If your good practice was already largely complexity consistent, then this might not require very much change at all. Mm. All right, thank you very much, Jill, from me and on behalf of the participants um, for your time today and for the very interesting talk. Um, for everyone, we'll put the webinar recording and slides up on our website. Um, check the website to get in touch with anyone at CCAN um, or, we, or uh, Hopefully we can um, 
get you in touch with Jill as well if you have any more questions. I'm sorry we didn't get time to answer all of the questions um, that were here today. It's been a very um, lively session. Thank you very much for everyone who participated. Um, that marks the end of our webinar today. Um, huge thanks again to you, Jill, and thank you to all of you listening who joined us today to take part. Goodbye. My pleasure. My pleasure entirely, and goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Bye.